Like every boy and his dog, I watched Star Wars as a kid, and I absolutely loved those films. They were such a stable of my childhood imagination and sense of aesthetic that it's hard to really put into words. And I guess the reason why it was Star Wars and not some other franchise is simply that it got there first. Science fiction and fantasy had never quite been realized as well in cinema, and next to Star Trek, Star Wars would set the gold standard for years to come. And the franchise knew how to brand itself too. Just like the Disney properties that it would eventually get absorbed into, there were so many toys, t-shirts, and jars of marmalade with that logo that you really couldn't miss it even if you tried. Something interesting about the franchise as well is the fact that it has a long list of video games and surprisingly, a significant number of them are actually pretty good. Back in the 90s and 2000s, there were flight simulators and arcade flying games like X-Wing, Rebel Assault, and Rogue Squadron, which were beloved by critics and audiences alike. There were racing games like Star Wars Pod Racer, a game that was super fun and very impressive at the time. I even have fond memories of the PC version of that crappy top-down Phantom Menace action game that I'm certain is probably terrible. But what can I say? I was a kid and I didn't know any better. Later on came the Knights of the Old Republic role-playing games, KOTOR for short. There's a massively multiplayer online role-playing game as well, but I've never really played that one since I'm kind of allergic to all things MMORPG. But hey, it's still going strong after 10 years with 8 expansions, so obviously they must be doing something right. There were countless other Star Wars games, some good, some of varying quality, but my absolute favorite of them all was the Jedi Knight series. I played the first game in the series, Dark Forces, as a kid in the 90s and I loved it. It was the first Star Wars video game I can remember playing. And in this one you don't actually get to play as a Jedi Knight, even though it's considered part of the canon of the later games where you do get to swing a lightsaber. But Dark Forces was just a highly faithful adaptation of all the visual elements and world building that I loved about the films. Playing it felt like walking through the film sets, blasting away stormtroopers and droids while admiring the art design, music and sound effects. It was so fun and engaging, right up until the moment you realized you were completely lost and had no idea how you could progress to the next level. Because this game has some of the worst 90s maze level design I can think of. Yeah, can we just talk about maze level design for a second? See, in the 90s, PC games were going through a bit of a growing phase. Bit by bit, most games were transitioning from 2D to 3D, and these innovations would eventually require a different approach to game design as seen in games like Half-Life and Deus Ex, where the world felt more realized and lived in. But around the time that Dark Forces and Doom were released, the focus was entirely on the gameplay loop, and every room was designed first and foremost with a focus on making the encounters with enemies challenging and fun. So without a coherent immersive world, the game world just ended up being a maze where you had to scavenge for key cards to progress. You're in it makes the moment to moment gameplay very fun because of the combat, but after wiping out all the enemies within the first few minutes of playing, you start to lose your momentum and it becomes very frustrating because you have to consult the map to figure out where to go. Dark Forces was one of the worst cases I've ever seen of this. These levels were huge and sprawling, and you just reached a point where you straight up had no choice but to turn on the map overlay and start bouncing that arrow against the outlines like you're playing some sort of top-down level editor. Looks like I'm passing through an intestinal tract here. What an apt metaphor for a sewage system. What an incredible smell you've discovered. By the end of it, you'd get a pat on the back and a full diploma in cartography. Yeah, it turns out this game was unintentionally educational. Who would have thought? The sequel to Dark Forces was Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight. This was the first in the series to incorporate full 3D, and it even features motion video cutscenes, which aside from being a mainstay in games like Command and Conquer, would be pretty much phased out of gaming by the early 2000s. Very intriguing. Oh my god, look at the full power of the CD-ROM. Look at these beautiful textures, those squares and polygons. Brings me right back, man. 
Jedi Knight doesn't have quite the same problems as Dark Forces, but the level design could still be counterintuitive at times, and the lightsaber fighting just looked awful from a first person perspective. Like you're whacking enemies with a pool noodle or something. I never played the expansion so I can't comment on that one, but out of the whole series, Jedi Knight has probably aged the poorest, occupying that very awkward spot in between the artistic character sprites of Dark Forces and the decent looking 3D models of Jedi Knight 2. The difference is comparable to Alone in the Dark, Clock Tower, and Resident Evil 2. Some would argue that the whole blocky aesthetic is just straight up ugly. Not me, of course. I like my early polygonal graphics, thank you very much. Taking a break from designing some of the best shooters of the 90s and early 2000s, Raven Software decided to take a swing at a sequel to Jedi Knight, and they didn't half-ass this in any way. Now they straight up kicked in the door and blew everyone away with not just the excellent Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast, but two years later they followed it up with another arguably even better sequel in the form of Jedi Academy. And these games are just excellent, even to this very day. The combat is a blast with its wide array of different weapons, but the real showstoppers are the lightsaber and force powers. There's pull, push, speed, and my personal favorites, lightning, and grip. Yeah, remember when Darth Vader choked people in Star Wars? Well, in these games you can pick up a dude by his neck and choke the life out of him, or slam him against a wall like he's a Raggedy Ann doll, or just straight up throw him over a ledge. And just like the Emperor himself, your fingertips can shock dozens of stormtroopers in an instant. It's friggin' great. And I really cannot emphasize enough just how excellent the lightsaber combat is. You can move in any direction while attacking, and depending on which direction you're moving in while holding down the attack button, your character will pull off a different attack. This means the combat is fast and fluid, and you don't feel like you're locked into an attack and left powerless to avert getting hit just because you pressed a button one too many times. You can react in real time and adjust the way someone actually would when facing an opponent. The system doesn't rely on hitting a block button in time with enemy attacks. The blocking happens automatically when correctly facing them, depending on the attack. It's a system that keeps you in the action and never has you thinking too long about a particular strategy or memorizing long-winded attack patterns. Jedi Academy also added a mission select screen where you could pick missions in the order you preferred, as well as dual lightsabers and my personal favorite, the double-bladed lightsaber. So I could actually live out my childhood fantasy of fighting like Darth Maul and looking like a total badass. It also added the single most annoying side character since Jar Jar Binks, but you can't win every battle, right? Hey Jaden, this should keep you busy till I finish the course. Hey, it was just a joke. Jedi Academy was the game I played the most in the series, as it had a very accessible single-player campaign and a strong online community based around modding, customization, and dueling. There was nothing quite like that feeling of joining a server and having a good old-fashioned duel with someone, or unleashing hell in a public server with some friends. It was just awesome. And that was it. For years and years, the closest we would get to any sequels would be the Force Unleashed series, which played more like exaggerated beat-em-up games drawing inspiration from God of War. There wasn't much here to pique my interest except for what at the time was an impressive physics engine to show off some of the Force powers, but gone was the free-flowing movement system and fluid combat, and there was no multiplayer. Years would pass by, and I'd occasionally boot up Jedi Academy or Jedi Knight 2 to run through the campaign or play online, but as time went on, I lost all hope that the series would ever make a return. And then, in 2019, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order arrived. And with it, it brought the hope that the Jedi Knight series might one day make a return. 
because it's clear to me that this game was made by people who are very passionate. This time around it's Respawn Entertainment who are at the helm, breaking a bit with their first person shooter roots from games like Titanfall and Apex Legends. There's a wonderful mix of elements from previous Star Wars games. Just like the Jedi Knight series, there are several force powers to augment your fighting capability, and similar to the Force Unleashed, there's some impressive tech and visuals, and no weapons aside from the lightsaber. You also get the inclusion of the double-bladed lightsaber from Jedi Academy, and the dual lightsabers even make a brief appearance late in the game, in the form of a powerful attack, so there's a lot to unpack here. In terms of gameplay, Fallen Order draws a lot of inspiration from games like Dark Souls, the Batman Arkham games, Uncharted, and elements of Metroidvania. You progress through a massive environment that loops in on itself like a spiral, with many areas being locked off until you gain access to new powers or abilities. You save your game at select points, and every time you save and recover your hit points and healing items, the enemies respawn. If you die, an enemy picks up your experience points and you have to land a hit to get the experience back from them or it's lost forever. You can upgrade your character through a progression skill tree with new branches being unlocked as you progress through the story. Experience is doled out at a very reasonable pace and you never feel like you're too weak to put up a fight. At least that was the case for me on the Jedi Knight difficulty. Enemies thankfully have a lot of wind up in their attacks and generally telegraph their moves very well, so you never feel like you can't see an attack coming. They even turn red whenever they charge up an unblockable attack, giving you plenty of chances to dodge. Every area has a few bosses that need defeating to progress, and these will put your skills to the test and prevent you from settling too far into a particular playstyle. Oftentimes they will either have unblockable attacks, meaning you have to dodge them, or that you won't be able to hit them unless you first block their attack, meaning you have to learn how to block. I'm no good at the rhythm of blocking and attacking, it's always just made more sense to me to not be where the attack is instead of waiting for it and then reacting by pushing the right button, so it took me a bit of time to get used to. Even then, the game wasn't too hard on me. But yeah, if you love blocking more than dodging, this game will make for an even better experience because it rewards blocking a lot. You get to counterattack and in some instances one hit kill enemies outright if you time your blocks correctly. There's a nice variation in enemies, all of which have their own attack patterns and fighting preferences, forcing you to mix up your attacks and frequently keeping you on your toes. The synergy between these enemies sometimes makes for some pretty desperate fights where you have to juggle them around and make moment to moment decisions about where to focus your attacks, and it can get pretty hairy when you have rocket troopers bearing down on you while fighting melee enemies or dodging in between flame trooper attacks and blasters. When you're down to your last enemy, they will typically either express fear at being isolated or try to psych themselves up. All enemies have a personality to go with how powerful they are. Regular stormtroopers are genuinely concerned when they see you, and the more powerful inquisitor troops are full of bravado, and even chide you for dodging or blocking too frequently. There are usually two factions of enemies in every level, one being imperial troops and the other being local wildlife or tomb guardians. On occasion the two will come into conflict and this is where things get especially desperate. Ever since games like Half-Life, I've loved this idea of setting enemies up against each other. It's this strategic element that makes you feel more connected to the world, since your enemies aren't exclusively interested in fighting just you. And sometimes it's just nice to manipulate some of the enemies into doing the hard work for you helping you to take down a giant monster, for instance. On occasion, you'll have to solve some physics-based puzzles, either by dragging around cables or moving around some big balls. These segments are pretty fun and not too challenging, and it's just nice to have something that breaks up the pace. They also remind the player about force powers like pull, push, and slow, as these are often integral to solving puzzles. There are far fewer force powers than in the Jedi Knight series, so there's unfortunately no option to grab someone by the neck using only the force, or to toast a group of stormtroopers. Though you can still throw them off the occasional ledge if they're standing by one. But the combat is still very satisfying, and the boss fights are more elaborate than in the Jedi Knight series, so it still works. There's a lot of climbing in the game. This is often used to enhance the scenery with gorgeous shots or create cinematic action sequences in the style of Uncharted, where everything is exploding all of the time and you just run this way and that way, and oh how exciting. 
look, everything is exploding, and oh my god, oh my god, it's just like playing a movie. <laughs> It's legit cool in some instances, but it starts to get a little ridiculous and feels like it's there to distract you from any kind of meaningful transition from area to area. After all, when everything is exploding and you're sliding down this way and that way, you're not likely to ask if the spaces make any kind of logical sense. Weirdo. <laughs> Failing a jump only costs you a tiny bit of health and sets you back a few seconds, which is fair because it can be easy to miss and plummet to your death. The platforming is a big part of the game, and is also used to gather collectibles, a lot of which either give you experience points, directly improves your health, or force meter, or just gives you some real bitchin' customization options. At first I thought this poncho look was boring as hell, but I gotta say, I think I'm styling pretty hard here. There's a cute robot companion, as is always the case in Star Wars. In fact, I think that might have been added in a clause somewhere by George Lucas when he sold the franchise to Disney. Yeah, just make sure there's always a cute droid that the main character is best friends with. I'm gonna buy another ranch with all this money. Goodbye. BD-1 is actually pretty cool and acts as a constant companion during gameplay. He sits on your shoulder, always ready to throw a stim pack or help solve a puzzle. You can ask him for a hint if you're stuck or just talk to him by pressing the down button. You, uh, know any jokes, BD? I don't know. Why? <laughs> Classic. As a result, you end up building a pretty strong connection with this little guy because he's always there, like a trusty shepherd dog or a fuzzy hamster. The coolest thing he does is show you the map, which is illustrated with this really neat Dead Space inspired hologram. And that's when you start to notice just how massive the levels in this game really are. These maps are huge and every level features areas that require a certain ability to reach. So if you want to avoid repetition in exploring these areas, it's almost better to do most of your exploring towards the end of the game when you've unlocked all of your abilities, so you're not wasting time running up against the same walls to progress again and again. That said, I can't really recommend going for 100% completion unless you're really obsessed with that kind of thing. Aside from the power-ups to health and force powers, most of the collectibles are clothing, lightsaber hilts, and bits of dialogue, with tiny increments of experience points doled out as well. It's not really something that alters the gameplay in any significant way. Using the hollow map is also pretty difficult, as it's hard to tell what's what and how to get there through the many layered levels of the map. So backtracking with a specific purpose in mind can be a real pain. It's fun enough that I'd go slightly out of my way for these collectibles, but there's no way I'm combing through all the layers of Cepho to find every poncho and saber hilt. The story's a bit hit and miss at times. There's some very interesting parts to it, but it doesn't quite jive with the slow pace of the Souls-like level design, because of how slowly the plot progresses. The game picks up five years after Revenge of the Sith. Most of the Jedi Order have been wiped out by Order of the Emperor, but a few are still hiding throughout the galaxy. One such Jedi is Cal Kestis. He's eventually discovered by the Inquisitors, an order of former Jedi who've been turned to the dark side through torture and brainwashing. Backed by an army of specialized stormtroopers, they turn every planet upside down looking for Jedi to convert or kill. To the Empire, we're all just expendable. Yes, you all. Uh, uh, no! Uh, uh, yes. Look at this. A Get on board! Cal is rescued by Breeze, the pilot of the Stinger Mantis, and Sierra Junda, a former Jedi Master with dreams of restoring the Jedi Order by way of a MacGuffin known as the Jedi Holocron, a device that contains the location of a list of Force-sensitive children in the galaxy. So Cal and his merry band of heroes go searching for clues to unlocking the holocron while dodging the nefarious inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish inquisition. It's an early setup that is a good fit for Star Wars, even if like so many other additions to the mythos, it involves a lot of threading in stuff that was never featured in the original trilogy. But it does make a lot of sense that the Empire would forcibly convert Jedi to the dark side, since these puny stormtroopers don't really look like they stand much of a chance when you can throw lightning at them. 
Okay, Jedi don't actually use force powers like that. I know, whatever. They they heal, use shield, and uh, they look through walls. God, Jedi are so boring. Sit there way cooler. I'm a bit torn when it comes to the main character. Not because of his backstory. No, no, all that stuff is actually really good and comes into play in a super awesome way late in the game. Now, it's more a matter of the performance, facial expression, and general body language of the character. I'm never one to disrespect an actor and say they did a bad job, because I sure couldn't even begin to do what they do. I mean, I don't think I could do motion capture foam sword fighting, or keep a straight face when talking to someone who's covered in ink dots. So I always try to give them the benefit of the doubt and simply say that they did the best they could with the material they were given. And the problem is just that Cal doesn't have much of a personality to him outside of his backstory. She had to watch her whole family perish. What do you know about those ruins? So the attempt at a subtle performance just doesn't really work throughout most of the game, because it doesn't give the player much to latch onto when his backstory is told through very infrequent flashbacks. And these flashbacks don't really contain any information we don't already know. I can sort of see what they set out to achieve with Cal given his backstory and his development later on in the game. He's a tortured soul living with the trauma of failing his Jedi Master, and suffers from survivor's guilt. But he's also written to be an action hero on a fast-paced adventure. And it feels like these two things are at odds quite frequently in both the performance and the writing. There's the threat of a hero's journey, but it feels a bit disconnected from the flow of the game itself. Hey, do me a favor. Stay alive down there. I'll add it to the plan. Alright, if you're jumping, you better do it now, kid. You ready for a swim, BD? <laughs> Given the fact that his backstory is the most interesting part of his character, it means that you go through large parts of the narrative not really identifying with how he's supposed to be feeling. As far as the other characters are concerned, it's a mixed bag. Seer is pretty zen, but with a sense of sorrow and regret to her character. She serves as a guide and mentor to Cal, but doesn't stray too far from the ship, so she mostly just talks and doesn't actually do much of anything. You learn a bit more about her as you progress through the game, and her backstory ties in with the main bad guy in a satisfying way, but it would have been nice to have her tag along on the adventure a bit more. Grease is more of a comical side character without much of a stake in what's going on. In general, he jokes around and reacts with sarcasm in all the ways you would expect a comedic sidekick to do in a blockbuster adventure. We used to scrap walkers on Braca. I'll just jack one. <laughs> get a load of the kid. He thinks we're back in the Clone Wars. Captain, uh, get us near those walkers. Wait, what? Listen. You've got a few bad guys that work very well. There's the second and ninth sisters who each have their own boss fights. And the second sister in particular ties into the backstory in a really interesting way. And you get to feel like her motivations actually make a lot of sense. And finding out what happens to her makes her feel more menacing yet strangely sympathetic. There are a few cameos from characters from the other movies that make their way into the game. And they feel like they've mostly been added for the sake of parody with the recent films more so than improving the story. The most significant example of this occurs towards the end of the game, but I won't spoil that here. Other characters are also introduced who don't really have much screen time and feel like they were supposed to be a much bigger part of the game, but were probably cut for time. I really enjoyed the theme of disempowerment. The idea that the Empire is this big imposing force that alters and corrupts people, forcing its will on them, you get the sense that the Inquisitors have been warped to serve the Emperor's purpose, and given power to do the same to others. The story toys with the idea that if you ever ended up getting captured by the Empire, you, just like everyone else, would crack under torture and turn just to save yourself. Because everyone has a limit. The genocide of the Jedi is treated as a major traumatic event that the survivors are still trying to recover from, and it even serves as part of the reason why Seer won't fight by Cal's side and why Cal has lost several of his force powers. So there's a believable reason why you don't just start off the game with everything unlocked. Cal has to gradually re-establish his connection with the force as he comes to terms with his trauma and his guilt. And that does make for a compelling character arc. I just wish it came across a bit more clearly in the writing of his character. 
The game looks gorgeous in much the same way as other Unreal Engine 4 games. The texture work is sublime, the animations are great, and effects like water, rain, cloth simulation, and so forth are spot on. There's some truly breathtaking visuals that will make you want to stop and admire the scenery on several occasions. It never ceases to amaze me that we've reached a point with video games where facial performances can be so intricately mapped onto 3D character models, and backdrops can be rendered and presented so well, that it really looks like you can go anywhere and do anything. Throughout the game you travel back and forth between a half a dozen different planets. The environments are all quite different and varied, ranging from ancient Jedi temples to imperial bases, jungles, icy caves, and what I would refer to as the Doom Planet. Jesus, this place is frickin' metal! I'm surprised the enemies here aren't armed with double neck guitars. Some of them literally have devil horns for crying out loud. Yeah, and this lady is bringing the dead back to life as zombies? Like, what the hell? The music is a solid mix of classic Star Wars with a few modern twists. The familiar orchestral instruments are all at play here, and there's tracks you've heard before, as well as new ones. For the most part it's what you would come to expect from a Star Wars game, but there are a few standouts in the soundtrack. There's a sort of peaceful theme that vaguely resembles something from the Elder Scrolls Skyrim. There's a theme that plays every time Cal is in danger and facing down an opponent who's much more powerful than him. The single most unique track in the game is one that completely breaks with the formula. Sugan Esana is a song that Cal is listening to at the start of the game, and this song actually comes back into play later. It's this really cool mix of warrior-like chanting with really funky sounding rock instrumentals composed by the Mongolian rock band The Who. It's very refreshing to hear this kind of music in a Star Wars game. It reminds me of how The Mandalorian had all these trippy hip hop slash synth influences. It's very creative. I dig it a lot. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? I've been playing the PlayStation 4 version of the game, and while I'd love to say the experience has been without any problems, I just can't. The frame rate can sometimes take a bit of a dip, but the worst offender is how frequently visual glitches seem to happen. This often plagues cinematics whenever the camera cuts from one shot to another and you see an object suddenly pop into existence when it hadn't been loaded in before. At various times, the game's physics can even freak out in comical ways that take you out of the experience completely. It's very jarring and gives the impression that the developers needed more time to have these bugs fixed, and that some of this is too extensive to be handled through patches. And keep in mind that this is me playing the game a year and a half after launch. I highly doubt there will be any significant performance patches coming out in the future. The loading times are very long, sometimes being upwards of a minute from the menu screen to loading a save and playing. I also experienced this issue where I would run through the environment so fast that the game had to freeze for 5 or 10 seconds to load the next part of the level. I get the impression that this is due to the game struggling to run on the PS4 with its mechanical hard drive, and that makes sense when you think about it. Jedi Fallen Order was released one year before the current generation of consoles, so this is very much a case of a developer coming up against the end of a console's lifespan and having to get creative in order to make it run well on that hardware. And with environments the size of what you see in this game, it's no wonder that the base PS4 struggles to keep up. I'm sure there are far less issues with the PS5 version, but with the faster hardware and solid state drive, but I can't confirm it. Thankfully these issues never really interfered with the gameplay, and I don't remember experiencing any crashes, even when having my PlayStation 4 in sleep mode for days at a time. All in all, Jedi Order is absolutely a worthy successor to the Jedi Knight series, and I'd say that it manages to blend several styles of gameplay in ways that feel both rewarding and refreshing for a AAA title. 
The action, climbing, puzzles, and general level design makes for a well-paced campaign, even if the story beats could do with being expanded upon a little more. At the time it was originally announced, EA made a big fuss about how there were no microtransactions in the game, and it feels kind of sad to have to say this in 2021, but they're sort of right. No microtransactions is actually a big deal. At no point was I greeted with any annoying prompts to buy tiny DLC packs full of stupid hats, or clobbered over the head with reminders of overpriced loot boxes for awful lightsaber camo skins, both of which would have definitely detracted from the experience. This is just a game from start to finish. There's not even any tacked on multiplayer mode forcing the developer to sidetrack for months to build something no one will play a few weeks after launch anyway. Jedi Fallen Order is just a long and satisfying single player campaign that invites you back with a new game plus mode. They very rarely make games like this anymore, especially companies like Electronic Arts who are all too fond of exploiting people's wallets. And this gives me hope that if EA were to one day lose the exclusive rights to publish Star Wars games, we could potentially have a remake of Jedi Knight that gets Disney's seal of approval. It would be an entirely different story that fits in with the new canon, sure, but they could still bring back some of the concepts that worked in the Jedi Knight games. And really, if I can just get to chokeslam a stormtrooper with the force again one day, I think I'll be a happy camper. They might want to update the AI a bit though. Hey, where are you going, buddy? Hey. Where are you going, buddy? What's that? Trouble at the old mill? Come back here. 